Hi, my name is Hannah. I'm a grad student in Dr. Greg Holland's group at San Diego State University. And today I'm talking on informing tunable biocomposite design with fiber formation in spiders and silkworms. If you look at the stress strain curves for several different fibers, you can see the mechanical properties are very diverse. Major ampullate silk used as a spider's drag line is very strong, while a cineform silk used by the spider for repping prey is very extensible. But is the diversity a result of the protein sequence or the actual process of silk formation? Looking at the sequence, you can see that there is this long repeat region, which has a lot of glycine and alanine in it. And this is true for both spiders and silkworms. These regions are interesting because inside of the gland, they are intrinsically disordered, but in the final fibers, they adopt more beta character. This transition occurs inside of the duct where you have salt exchange, where monovalent anions are exchanged for divalent anions. There are shear forces, which are important for alignment, and then a pH gradient, which is necessary for inducing fibrillization. But the question remains of how the protein structure develops within this duct region. To study this, I combined NMR, IR imaging, and transmission electron microscopy. NMR gives information about atomic level interactions, but before I could study this, I needed to overcome the signal to noise ratio. To do this, I fed silkworms phenylalanine and alanine, and you can see that the amino acids, which are also seen in the repeat regions, come through as a result of this labeling scheme, both in solution and solid state NMR. Next, I looked at the random coil to beta sheet transition using infrared imaging. To do this, I fixed spider glands with glutaraldehyde and then sectioned them. And you can see the sections near the tail end where the proteins are formed, have more helical random coil structure. And then as you go toward the duct end, you see this little shoulder form, which indicates the presence of beta character. And finally, I used transmission electron microscopy to try and mimic the gland environment with different stains. When I added ammonium molybdate, which has divalent anions in it, I saw both native-like structure and these dense droplets. But when I'd used urinal acetate, which is more acidic, and multiple washes of water, I saw this fibrillization starting to occur. So for future work, I'm going to continue with the NMR analysis, but my main goal is to focus on cryo-electron microscopy, which will allow me to look at the different silk proteins in a more native environment. With that, I would like to thank my lab mates for letting me use their mechanical testing data, as well as the electron microscope facilities at both San Diego State and UCSD. And thank you for listening.